千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. 
and the finger pointing and the assignment of blame that's happening between the various parties and people that are involved in this stuff. And it becomes really easy to believe that none of us as individuals has any influence on, on the goings-on. And it's really easy to think of ourselves as insignificant, relatively helpless in the national or global picture of things. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. And if ever there was a time for, for each of us to live the, the Tao teachings, you know, this is it. Now's the time for us to set the example of non-contention and, and of virtue without attachment, if ever there was one. And you all may be thinking right about now, well, it's all fine and good, and I try to do that as best I can, but you know, what's that going to do for us? How is my example, how's my life, how do my activities influence what happens? on a national or global scale. Those things may not be readily apparent, but trust me, they exist. Chapter 79 of the Tao Te Ching talks about this very thing. And forgive me, I normally incorporate these into my presentation, but I really didn't want to do that much typing. So I just went out and got the online translation of the Tao Te Ching off the website, and hopefully you all can see it now. Lao Tzu says, after settling a great dispute, there must be remaining resentments. How can this be considered good? Therefore, the sage holds the left part of the contract, but does not demand payment from the other person. Those who have virtue hold the contract. Those without virtue hold the collections. The heavenly Tao has no favorite. It constantly gives to the kind people. In ancient China, a contract was often established, not on paper, but on pieces of bark or you know, materials that were handy and readily available. And as it was written, or after it was written, it would be broken in half, and the holder of the contract would receive the left half, and the person who was the, the debtor or the, the, uh, the obligor, if you will, the person who had the obligation under the contract would receive the right. And that way, if there was a dispute as to what was agreed to, the two halves could be produced and matched up and the agreement in its totality could be viewed. This is not altogether unlike going to the bank to borrow money to buy a car or a major appliance, right? You agree by signing that you're going to uphold your end of the bargain and, and pay off your obligation to the bank. And the bank, if you fail to do so, has remedies at law to, to compel you either to, to, to pay up or return whatever it was you bought. The bank holds the left half. You, as the borrower, hold the right. Lao Tzu says something about this. <laughs> Those who with virtue hold the contract. Those without virtue hold the collections. If any of you have ever been in a position where you were late paying a medical bill or a car payment or the rent or whatever, you understand what it means to hold collections because those folks can be ruthless. And in fact, there is an entire body of law in the United States that governs what a collector can and cannot do because of some of the practices those folks have engaged in to try to extract money from debtors. Up until the early 1800s in Europe, there were debtors' prisons, where if for whatever reason you couldn't pay your bills, you wound up in jail for it. That practice is uh, disavowed constitutionally in this country. But it wasn't very long ago that that was a 
a common practice. I suppose at one level, you can't blame the, the creditor for wanting to be paid. But there is uh, an element of the absence of mercy and compassion in, 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 in that practice, right? Every now and again, there's a legitimate reason why somebody winds up in financial problems. It does happen. Job loss, divorce, whatever. You know, sometimes it happens. And what you find is, is that the people that are, are eager and willing to lend when times are good are equally as eager and willing uh, <laughs> to, to become torturously ruthless when times are bad. At a commercial level, I suppose that's unavoidable. At a personal level, there, there should be a very deep and compelling meaning here for all of us. The practice of virtue in our lives would dictate that we have some understanding and compassion for our fellow man, that we understand both the obligation and the circumstances of, of another person's life. And as I watch what's going on nationally and globally right now, what I see is that, that absence of mercy and compassion, that, that lack of willingness to demonstrate a bit of understanding for the condition of others or for the viewpoints of others. And, and so there are great disputes being settled right now nationally. And there are going to be winners and losers in those settlements. People are going to be helped and other people are going to be harmed. And this isn't what Lao Tzu had in mind when he penned chapter 79. He's talking to us about how we should behave in those circumstances. And at the end of the process, there are going to be resentments and ill will. And we're going to be faced with Lao Tzu's question, how can this be considered good? Right now, and I, I don't know how many of you pay attention to the news, but right now in Washington, the leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, is exercising uh, his resentments and ill will by not allowing any legislation that's proposed by the democratically controlled House of Representatives to get to the floor of the Senate, no matter what. It is within his purview and power to do that. But I'm not sure that what he's doing is for the benefit of the country. In the House, there are 67 members, uh, 70 members now, that are calling for the impeachment of the president. Once again, I'm not sure that what they're doing is in the best interests of the country. Like him or not, Donald Trump was the duly elected president. And we can all argue about how he got there and whether or not he won legitimately, but the simple fact of the matter is that he is the duly elected president, and the infighting, backbiting, and shin-kicking that's going on is not producing progress. How can this be considered good? So, there's the bigger picture that we can all look at as an example for the for business as usual, if you will. But as we watch those activities and, and, and processes unfold, we should all be looking in the mirror as well and evaluating our own lives to determine if we too are invested in and in, in acting in that sort of a manner. If we're looking at our national representatives and thinking, gee, what a bunch of buttheads these guys are, 
we probably should also turn our gaze inwards to see if perhaps we haven't been those very same people. And if we have, perhaps it's time to consider a different way of doing things. And it may be true that no one of us individually can affect significant change on a national or global front. But it's also true that all of us together, holding on to a vision of a better world and a more peaceful existence absolutely can. What does it mean to you to hold the left part of the contract, and how does that apply to our collective situation? You know, we all have obligations and people that are obligated to us. When we look at ourselves, are we the holder of the contract or the collections? Are we the person with virtue or the person without? Do we have compassion on those who are obligated to us? Do we act with forthrightness and honesty towards the ones we're obligated to? Do our lives speak for themselves when it comes time to, to justify our actions and our behaviors? Can we follow the example of the Tao itself and give freely and with kindness to those who are kind to us and show compassion to those who are not. Those are questions within ourselves we have to examine and behaviors we have to rectify and refine because it's really easy to take the, the easy or negative path or to hold somebody's feet to the fire for, for what their circumstances may have done to them. As we follow that path, as we embrace and follow the Tao teachings, we hopefully can cause others to follow it as well. To let other people see the light that shines from within us. And maybe seeing that, will cause them to become a little curious and want to investigate how it is that we're able to be the way that we are in the circumstances that we're faced with. Particularly when uh, times that are somewhat less than auspicious fall upon us. If we can remain positive and be the people we ought to be instead of the people that we could be, we might be able to help others to find that path as well. And in that way, perhaps we can help to create a nation and a, a world of peace and of non-contention. That should be a goal for every single one of us as we go through the path of our lives. And it's absolutely the truth that, that every time I hop on here, I talk about lofty goals and about a dreamer's desire for peace and life free from conflict. That's a, been a dream of mine forever. I'm kind of a strict adherent to John Lennon's Imagine. <laughs> but I believe that it's actually possible if, if we all want to get there together and move to do so. Because a, a better world starts with a better example, and a better example starts with each and every one of us. And, and man, if ever there was a time for it, it's now. So if, if not us, who? And if not now, when? You know, if we put even half the energy into solving the problems of the country and the world that we spend fighting over them, you know, we could solve world hunger, hunger and global climate change and poverty and all the various forms of social inequality that exist right now with time left over. And I, I don't understand why, why most people don't seem to understand that we are a, a country full of smart people. And we ought to be able to figure out a better way of doing things. You know, the United States has always been a country based on innovation and, and acceptance and tolerance and diversity. 
And all of those qualities have made us all better for it. Somewhere along the way, we seem to have lost sight of the fact that, that it is all of those differences that bring us together and that unity that makes us better than, than any one of the parts. So yeah, I believe the dream's possible. I believe one day that imagine could be the truth. And I hope with all of my heart that one day it happens. I'm not going to see it with you. But for as long as I'm able to talk, I'm going to suggest that that's the way to go. Thank you all so very much for letting me share with you this morning. And I, I hope, as always, that something I said was, was helpful to someone. Thank you. Hey, Bill, thank you for that talk. Uh, the number one issue that is on my mind right now uh, applies not just to today, but all the times when things are chaotic, you know, for whatever reason, you know, other than the reasons that we're currently enduring, there can be many other reasons when times are chaotic. So, can you suggest some ways to use the Tao to keep ourselves calm and collected and at peace in times of chaos? Oh, sure. I, I guess the number one thing that I'd say is that the, the best time to cultivate those practices isn't when your life falls apart. <laughs> The, the time to cultivate those practices is when times are good and, and it's easy to study and easy to remember and easy to meditate so that when things become difficult, you've got the tools at hand to cope and, and to remain in that Tao-centric perspective uh, because it's, it's awfully difficult to, to remember to grab the life preserver when the ship's sinking. Excellent, excellent. So you, uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you brought up the issue of non-contention. So uh, I think, you know, as we go through life, we all encounter situations where uh, contention presents itself as a possibility. So how do we what do we, uh, I'll have some thoughts to present on this, but I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on what happens when contention presents itself and you wish to sidestep or avoid that contention. What would you do? <laughs> you and I have known each other for a long time. <laughs> you, you know early on, when I when I first started studying the Tao, my uh, my method of dealing with conflict was to kick the door in and come in with both guns blazing. <laughs> so forgive me for chuckling. <laughs> it's amazing how time changes our perspective. I've I've found that that they, one can deal with conflict without becoming embroiled in the conflict. That, that is, you can you can address the issue at hand without uh, without accepting the 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 heightened emotions, the tension, or the anger. And uh, it's it's awfully tough to argue with somebody who flat out refuses to argue. You know, a person who refuses to fight has a tough time finding an opponent, and, and that's how I deal with it. So you and simply somebody do wants not. So you simply do not engage. Uh, not, not, not in the, not in the fight. No, uh, I, I can still. The, the place I, I get into this the most often, believe it or not, is at the office, where there are usually multiple opposing views about how to deal with a problem. You know, you have a situation arise, and four or five people all want to argue a particular position about how to how to handle it. And sometimes that gets heated. But the second you drag personalities into it, then it ceases to be a discussion about problem solving and starts to become a, a mutual denigration thing that doesn't produce any progress. And you can refuse to participate in the personal fight 
and, and still try to solve the problem. Are there Tai Chi movements uh, that you teach, you know, the circular kind of movements that can be used as like a metaphor for uh, deflecting uh, incoming attacks or resolving potential conflicts? Certainly. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I tell people, well, I'm, I'm kind of retired these days, but I used to tell people and still believe, you know, the, the, the Taiji Tran training isn't just about fighting, it's about living. I don't, I don't teach people how to fight, I teach them how to live. And that, that actually absolutely is the truth. Uh, it, it doesn't make any difference what kind of fight somebody's trying to pick with you. There are two philosophies, Fa Jing and Xian Jing, issuing power and borrowing or stealing energy uh, that apply to, to those situations. And in, in one case, uh, one uses an opponent's in, in energy to, uh, to redirect their force back on themselves, and in the other, you, you take the energy away from them in order to, to, to weaken their assault. Those can be applied to, to virtually any kind of confrontation. Uh, for instance, if, if someone wants to argue by name calling and, and denigration and uh, you know trying to pick a fight with a, a person as a person instead of with the issue, uh, one simply allows that to blow out until it's over and then comes back on track to whatever the situation is. And by allowing somebody to do whatever it is they're going to do without responding to it with like force, uh, they tend to eventually, you know, tire themselves out and get tired of yelling and screaming. I've had that work on, on countless occasions. Uh, the, the other concept is, is simply to allow the person to attempt to launch an assault and then redirect that back to the problem. And then once again, by not getting all excited, by not trying to overcome force with force, uh, but overcoming force with softness, uh, it causes the entire energy of the assault to kind of die out and go away. It takes less effort for me to defend myself than it does for them to continue to try and assault me. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Bill, uh, thank you so much for your talk today. And Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.